Section 24 of The Wonderful Adventures of Nils. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Wonderful Adventures of Nils by Selma Lagerlöf. Translated by Velma Swanston Howard. The Story of Carr and Greyskin, Part Three. The Big War of the Moths. The following spring, as Carr was dashing through the forest one morning, he heard someone behind him calling, Carr, Carr. He turned and saw the old fox standing outside his lair. You must tell me if the humans are doing anything for the forest, said the fox. Yes, you may be sure they are, said Skar. They are working as hard as they can. They have killed all my kinsfolk, and they'll be killing me next, protested the fox. But they shall be pardoned for that, if only they save the forest. That year, Carr never ran into the woods without some animals asking if the humans could save the forest. It was not easy for the dog to answer. The people themselves were not certain that they could conquer the moss. But considering how feared and hated old Kolmården had always been, it was remarkable that every day more than a hundred men went there to work. They cleared away the underbrush. They felled dead trees, looped off branches from the live ones so that the caterpillars could not easily crawl from tree to tree. They also dug wide trenches around the ravaged parts and put up lime-washed fences to keep them out of new territory. Then they painted rings of lime around the trunks of trees to prevent the caterpillars leaving those they had already stripped. The idea was to force them to remain where they were until they starved to death. The people worked with the forest until far into the spring. They were hopeful and could hardly wait for the caterpillars to come out from their eggs, feeling certain that they had shut them in so effectually that most of them would die of starvation. But in the early summer the caterpillars came out more numerous than ever. They were everywhere. They crawled on the country roads, on fences, on the walls of the cabins. They wandered outside the confines of Liberty Forest, to other parts of Kolmården. They won't stop till all our forests are destroyed, sighed the people, who were in great despair and could not enter the forest without weeping. Carr was so sick of the sight of all these creeping, gnawing things that he could hardly bear to step outside the door. But one day he felt that he must go and find out how Greyskin was getting on. He took the shortest cut to the elk's horns and hurried along, his nose close to the earth. When he came to the tree stump where he had met Helpless the year before, the snake was still there and called to him. "'Have you told Greyskin what I said to you when last we met?' asked the water snake. Carr only growled and tried to get at him. If you haven't told him, by all means do so, insisted the snake. You must see that the humans know of new cure for this plague. Neither do you, retorted the dog and ran on. Carr found Greyskin, but the elk was so low-spirited that he scarcely greeted the dog. He began at once to talk of the forest. I don't know what I wouldn't give if this misery were only at an end, he said. Now I shall tell you that this said you could save the forest. Then Carr delivered the water snake's message. If any one but helpless had promised this, I should immediately go into exile, declared the elk. But how can a poor water snake have the power to work such a miracle. Of course it's only bluff, said Carr. Water snakes always like to pretend that they know more than other creatures. When Carr was ready to go home, Grayskin accompanied him part of the way, 
Presently Karr heard a thrush perched on a pine top cry. There goes Grayskin, who has destroyed the forest. There goes Grayskin, who has destroyed the forest. Karr thought that he had not heard correctly, but the next moment a hare came darting across the path. When the hare saw them, he stopped, flapped his ears, and screamed. Here comes Grayskin, who has destroyed the forest. Then he ran as fast as he could. What do they mean by that? asked Karr. I really don't know, said Grayskin. I think that the small forest animals are displeased with me because I was the one who proposed that we should ask help of human beings. When the underbrush was cut down, all their lairs and hiding places were destroyed. They walked on together a while longer, and Carr heard the same cry coming from all directions. There goes Grayskin, who has destroyed the forest. Grayskin pretended not to hear it, but Carr understood why the elk was so downhearted. I say, Grayskin, what does the water snake mean by saying you killed the one he loved best? How can I tell? said Grayskin. You know very well that I never kill anything. Shortly after that, they met the four old elk, crooked back. Antler Crown, Rough Mane, and Big and Strong, who were coming along slowly one after the other. Well met in the forest, called Grayskin. Well met in turn, answered the elk. We were just looking for you, Grayskin, to consult with you about the forest. The fact is, began Crooked Back, we have been informed that a crime has been committed here, and that the whole forest is being destroyed because the criminal has not been punished. What kind of crime was it? Someone killed a harmless creature that he couldn't eat. Such an act is accounted a crime in Liberty Forest. Who could have done such a cowardly thing? wondered Grayskin. They say that an elk did it, and we were just going to ask if you knew who it was. No, said Grayskin. I have never heard of an elk killing a harmless creature. Grayskin parted from the four old elk and went on with Carr. He was silent and walked with lowered head. They happened to pause Crawley, the adder, who lay on his shelf of rock. "'There goes Grayskin, who has destroyed the whole forest,' hissed Crawley, like all the rest. By that time Grayskin's patience was exhausted. He walked up to the snake and raised a forefoot. "'Do you think of crushing me as you crushed the old water snake?' hissed Crawley. "'Did I kill a water snake?' asked Grayskin, astonished. The first day you were in the forest, you killed the wife of poor old helpless, said Crawley. Grayskin turned quickly from the adder and continued his walk with Carr. Suddenly he stopped. Carr, it was I who committed that crime. I killed a harmless creature. Therefore it is on my account that the forest is being destroyed. "'What are you saying?' Carr interrupted. "'You must tell the water-snake helpless that Grayskin goes into exile tonight.' "'That I shall never tell him,' protested Carr. "'The far north is a dangerous country for elk. "'Do you think that I wish to remain here when I have caused a disaster like this?' protested Grayskin. Don't be rash. Sleep over it before you do anything. It was you who taught me that the elk are one with the forest, said Grayskin. And so saying, he parted from Carr. The dog went home alone, but his talk with Grayskin troubled him, and the next morning he returned to the forest to seek him. But Grayskin was not to be found, and the dog did not search long for him. He realized that the elk had taken the snake at his word and had gone into exile. 
On his walk home, Carr was too unhappy for words. He could not understand why Grayskin should allow the wretch of a water snake to trick him away. He had never heard of such folly. What power can that old helpless have? As Carr walked along, his mind full of these thoughts, he happened to see the gamekeeper who stood pointing up at a tree. "'What are you looking at?' asked a man who stood beside him. "'Sickness has come among the caterpillars,' observed the gamekeeper. Carr was astonished, but he was even more angered at the snakes having the power to keep his word. Grayskin would have to stay away a long time, for of course that water snake would never die. At the very height of his grief a thought came to Carr, which comforted him a little. Perhaps the water snake won't live so long after all, he thought. Surely he cannot always lie protected under a tree root. As soon as he has cleaned out the caterpillars, I know someone who is going to bite his head off. It was true that an illness had made its appearance among the caterpillars. The first summer it did not spread much. It had only just broken out when it was time for the larva to turn into puppy. From the latter came millions of moths. They flew around in trees like a blinding snowstorm, and laid countless number of eggs. An even greater destruction was prophesied for the following year. The destruction came not only to the forest, but also to the caterpillars. The sickness spread quickly from forest to forest. The sick caterpillars stopped eating, crawled up to the branches of the trees, and died there. There was great rejoicing among the people when they saw them die, but there was even greater rejoicing among the forest animals. From day to day the dog Carr went about with savage glee, thinking of the hour when he might venture to kill Helpless. But the caterpillars, meanwhile, had spread over miles of pine woods. Not in one summer did the disease reach them all. Many lived to become puppies and moths. Grayskin sent message to his friend Carr by the birds of passage to say that he was alive and faring well. But the birds told Carr confidentially that on several occasions Grayskin had been pursued by poachers and that only with the greatest difficulty had he escaped. Carr lived in a state of continual grief, yearning, and anxiety. Yet he had to wait two whole summers more before there was an end of the caterpillars. Carr no sooner heard the gamekeeper say that the forest was out of danger than he started on a hunt for helpless. But when he was in the thick of the forest, he made a frightful discovery. He could not hunt any more. He could not run. He could not track his enemy, and he could not see at all. During the long years of waiting, old age had overtaken Carr. He had grown old without having noticed it. He had not the strength even to kill a water snake. He was not able to save his friend Grayskin from his enemy. Retribution one afternoon, Akka from Kebnekaise and her flock alighted on the shore of a forest lake. Spring was backward, as it always is in the mountain districts. Ice covered all the lake, save a narrow strip next the land. The geese at once plunged into the water to bathe and hunt for food. In the morning, Nils Holgersson had dropped one of his wooden shoes, so he went down by the elms and birches that grew along the shores to look for something to bind around his foot. The boy walked quite a distance before he found anything that he could use. He glanced about nervously, for he did not fancy being in the forest. Give me the plains and the lakes, he thought. There you can see what you are likely to meet. Now, if this were a grove of little birches, it would be well enough, for then the ground would be almost bare. But how people can like these wild, pathless forests is incomprehensible to me. If I owned this land, I would chop down every tree. At last he caught sight of a piece of birch bark, 
and just as he was fitting it to his foot, he heard a rustle behind him. He turned quickly. A snake darted from the brush straight toward him. The snake was uncommonly long and thick, but the boy soon saw that it had a white spot on each cheek. Why, it's only a water snake, he laughed. It can't harm me. But the next instant the snake gave him a powerful blow on the chest that knocked him down. The boy was on his feet in a second and running away, but the snake was after him. The ground was stony and scrubby. The boy could not proceed very fast, and the snake was close at his heels. Then the boy saw a big rock in front of him and began to scale it. I do hope the snake can't follow me here, he thought, but he had no sooner reached the top of the rock than he saw that the snake was following him. Quite close to the boy, on a narrow ledge at the top of the rock, lay a round stone as large as a man's head. As the snake came closer, the boy ran behind the stone and gave it a push. It rolled right down on the snake, drawing it along to the ground, where it landed on its head. That stone did its work well, thought the boy, with a sigh of relief, as he saw the snake squirm a little, and then lie perfectly still. I don't think I have been in greater peril on the whole journey, he said. He had hardly recovered from the shock when he heard a rustle above him and saw a bird circling through the air to light on the ground right beside the snake. The bird was like a crow in size and form, but was dressed in a pretty coat of shiny black feathers. The boy cautiously retreated into a crevice of the rock. His adventure in being kidnapped by crows was still fresh in his memory, and he did not care to show himself where there was no need of it. The bird strode back and forth beside the snake's body, and turned it over with his beak. Finally he spread his wings and began to shriek in ear-splitting tones. It is certainly helpless, the water snake that lies dead here. Once more he walked the length of the snake. Then he stood in a deep study and scratched his neck with his foot. It isn't possible that there can be two such big snakes in the forest, he pondered. It must surely be helpless. He was just going to thrust his beak into the snake, but suddenly checked himself. You mustn't be a numbskull, Bataki, he remarked to himself. Surely you cannot be thinking of eating the snake until you have called Karr. He wouldn't believe that Helpless was dead unless he could see it with his own eyes. The boy tried to keep quiet. But the bird was so ludicrously solemn as he stalked back and forth, chattering to himself, that he had to laugh. The bird heard him, and with a flap of his wings he was up on the rock. The boy rose quickly and walked toward him. Are you the one who is called Bataki the raven? And are you not a friend of Akka from Kebnekaise? asked the boy. The bird regarded him intently, then nodded three times. Surely you're not the little chap who flies around with the wild geese and whom they call Thumbitot? Oh, you're not so far out of the way, said the boy. What luck that I should have run across you. Perhaps you can tell me who killed this water snake. The stone which I rolled down on him killed him, replied the boy, and related how the whole thing happened. That was cleverly done for one who is as tiny as you are, said the raven. I have a friend in these parts who will be glad to know that this snake has been killed, and I should like to render you a service in return. Then tell me why you are glad that the water snake is dead, responded the boy. It's a long story, said the raven. You wouldn't have the patience to listen to it. But the boy insisted that he had, and then the raven told him the whole story about Carr and Greyskin and Helpless the water snake. When he had finished, the boy sat quietly for a moment, looking straight ahead. Then he spoke. I seem to like the forest better since hearing this. I wonder if there is anything left of the old Liberty Forest. 
Most of it has been destroyed, said Bataki. The trees look as if they had passed through a fire. They'll have to be cleared away, and it will take many years before the forest will be what it once was. That snake deserved his death declared the boy but i wonder if it could be possible that he was so wise he could send sickness to the caterpillars perhaps he knew that they frequently became sick in that way intimidated bataki yes that may be but all the same i must say that he was a very wily snake the boy stopped talking because he saw the raven was not listening to him but sitting with gaze averted. Hark, he said, Carr is in the vicinity. Won't he be happy when he sees that helpless is dead? The boy turned his head in the direction of the sound. He's talking with the wild geese, he said. Oh, you may be sure that he has dragged himself down to the strand to get the latest news about Grayskin. Both the boy and the raven jumped to the ground and hastened down to the shore. All the geese had come out of the lake and stood talking with an old dog who was so weak and decrepit that it seemed as if he might drop dead at any moment. "'There's Carr, said Bataki to the boy. "'Let him hear first what the wild geese have to say to him. Later we shall tell him that the water snake is dead.' Presently they heard Akka talking to Karr. It happened last year while we were making our usual spring trip, remarked the leader ghost. We started out one morning, Ixi, Kaxi, and I, and we flew over the great boundary forest between Dalekarlia and Helsingland. Under us we saw only thick pine forests. The snow was still deep among the trees, and the creeks were mostly frozen. Suddenly we noticed three poachers down in the forest. They were on skis and had dogs in leash, carried knives in their belts, but had no guns. As there was a hard crust on the snow, they did not bother to take the winding forest path, but skied straight ahead. Apparently they knew very well where they must go to find what they were seeking. We wild geese flew on high up in the air so that the whole forest under us was visible. When we sighted the poachers, we wanted to find out where the game was, so we circled up and down, peering through the trees. Then, in a dense thicket, we saw something that looked like big moss covered rocks, but couldn't be rocks, for there was no snow on them. We shot down suddenly and lit in the center of the thicket. The three rocks moved. They were three elk, a bull and two cows, resting in the bleak forest. When we alighted, the elk bull rose and came toward us. He was the most superb animal we had ever seen. When he saw that it was only some poor wild geese that had awakened him, he lay down again. No, old granddaddy, you mustn't go back to sleep, I cried. Flee as fast as you can. There are poachers in the forest, and they are bound for this very dear fold. Thank you, ghost mother, said the elk. He seemed to be dropping to sleep while he was speaking. But surely you must know that we elk are under the protection of the law at this time of the year. Those poachers are probably out for fox, he yawned. There are plenty of fox trails in the forest, but the poachers are not looking for them. Believe me, old granddaddy, they know that you are lying here and are coming to attack you. They have no guns with them, only spears and knives, for they dare not fire a shot at this season. The elk bull lay there calmly, but the elk cows seemed to feel uneasy. It may be as the geese say, they remarked, beginning to bestir themselves. You just lie down, said the elk bull. There are no poachers coming here, of that you may be certain. There was nothing more to be done, so we wild geese rose again into the air, but we continued to circle over the place to see how it would turn out for the elk. We had hardly reached our regular flying altitude when we saw the elk bull come out from the thicket. 
He sniffed the air a little, then walked straight toward the poachers. As he strode along, he stepped upon dry twigs that crackled noisily. A big barren marsh lay just beyond him. Thither he went and took his stand in the middle, where there was nothing to hide him from view. There he stood until the poachers emerged from the woods. Then he turned and fled in the opposite direction. The poachers let loose the dogs, and they themselves skied after him at full speed. The elk threw back his head and looped as fast as he could. He kicked up snow until it flew like a blizzard about him. Both dogs and men were left far behind. Then the elk stopped as if to await their approach. When they were within sight, he dashed ahead again. We understood that he was purposely tempting the hunters away from the place where the cows were. We thought it brave of him to face danger himself, in order that those who were dear to him might be left in safety. None of us wanted to leave the place until we had seen how all this was to end. Thus the chase continued for two hours or more. We wondered that the poachers went to the trouble of pursuing the elk when they were not armed with rifles. They couldn't have thought that they could succeed in tiring out a runner like him. Then we noticed that the elk no longer ran so rapidly. He stepped on the snow more carefully, and every time he lifted his feet, blood could be seen in his tracks. We understood why the poachers had been so persistent. They had counted on help from the snow. The elk was heavy, and with every step he sank to the bottom of the drift. The hard crust on the snow was scraping his legs. It scraped away the fur and tore out pieces of flesh, so that he was in torture every time he put his foot down. The poachers and the dogs, who were so light that the ice crust could hold their weight, pursued him all the while. He ran on and on, his steps becoming more and more uncertain and faltering. He gasped for breath. Not only did he suffer intense pain, but he was also exhausted from wading through the deep snowdrifts. At last he lost all patience. He paused to let poachers and dogs come upon him, and was ready to fight them. As he stood there waiting, he glanced upward. When he saw us wild geese circling above him, he cried out, Stay here, wild geese, until all is over, and the next time you fly over Colmorden, look up Carr and ask him if he doesn't think that his friend Greyskin has met with a happy end. When Akka had gone so far in her story, the old dog rose and walked nearer to her. Greyskin led a good life, he said. He understands me. He knows that I'm a brave dog, and that I shall be glad to hear that he had a happy end. Now tell me how... He raised his tail and threw back his head, as if to give himself a bold and proud bearing. Then he collapsed. Car, car, called a man's voice from the forest. The old dog rose obediently. My master is calling me, he said, and I must not tarry longer. I just saw him load his gun. Now we two are going into the forest for the last time. Many thanks, wild goose. I know everything that I need now to die content. End of the story of Carr and Greyskin, part three. Read by Lars Rolander.